Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Measures of Growth 2021, our 27th release, and to the Maine Economic Growth Council. My name is Yellow Light Breen. I'm the CEO of Maine Development Foundation, or MDF, and we are privileged to provide the staff support for the Maine Economic Growth Council, uh, a bipartisan, nonpartisan group uh, appointed by the governor and the leadership of the legislature to provide a, a long-term uh, report card and roadmap on the main economy to guide policymakers, decision makers, communities, citizens, where the economy in Maine is really at and a really comprehensive uh, portrait, um, where it's going and what we need to aspire to as a state to achieve the economic prosperity that we all desire for Maine. Um, I am joined today by several members of the council who are gonna help me um, describe the insights from this year's report and connect that insights to what insight to what they see going on around the Maine economy. I'm joined by Growth Council Chair Steve Von Vogt, President and CEO of Maine Marine Composites, uh, Growth Council Member Luann Ballesteros, Vice President, External and Governmental Affairs at the Jackson Laboratory, Heather Johnson, the Commissioner of the Maine Department of Economic and Community Development, and legislative members of the Growth Council, Senator James Dill of Penobscot and Senator Trey Stewart of Aroostook. We're also joined by a couple of our other council members, uh, Thomas Kittredge from Belfast and Donna Cassessi from Skowhegan. Um, and it's a great group who really dives into the data and tries to understand uh, what's going on and what are the long-term trend lines that Maine people and Maine leaders should care about. Um, I'll just help kick things off this afternoon by reviewing a few of the key highlights, um, what's in the report this year, and then turning it over to the council members to really dig in on what's important and why. Um, first of all, um, the indicators are all long-term in nature. And as we go through an incredibly short-term, we hope disruption like the pandemic and a deep recession, um, the question of you know, what is permanently altered in the main economy, what is going to revert to its long-term trend, and what are the new trends uh, that we might be seeing out of this disruptive transformative crisis? That's something we've been thinking a lot about over the last two years, and you'll hear us talk a little bit about that today. Often we attempt to compare the benchmarks not only to Maine's own performance and our own history, but to national, regional, um, or peer state points of comparison so that we can really say, you know, how good is good, how far up is up relative not only to where we are, but where it would be desirable for us to aspire to. The report includes 30 indicators. So one of the things that sets measures of growth apart from many of the um, you know, benchmarks or indices that are in the news is how comprehensive it is. It covers everything from core economic data to community indicators, to environmental indicators, to educational indicators. And it really tries to paint that balanced scorecard about Maine's assets, Maine's challenges, and the opportunities that are that lie within to move us forward, even here in the pandemic and post pandemic world. We do not oversimplify and assign it like a simple letter grade, like other report cards that are handed out across the country. We think the, the economy is complex, it's interdependent. These factors have to work together. Some of these factors are drivers of opportunity. Some of them are the valuable things about what makes Maine uniquely Maine that we don't wanna lose along the way as we try to grow prosperity and jobs. Uh, within the indicators this year, uh, seven indicators or about a quarter of them lost ground versus the benchmark. Uh, I, I'm sorry, seven made progress against their benchmarks. Uh, about a similar number, eight, another quarter lost ground and about half or 14 held their ground against the uh, benchmark, so it's a mixed bag. This year, we're mostly looking at data from 2020. So bear in mind that as we draw these long-term trend conclusions, um, we are looking at what happened in the first year of the pandemic. And in some cases, we're trying to extrapolate what we know is happening now, uh, leaping off from uh, last year's known data. We took the opportunity this year to extend the benchmarks themselves out to 2030. Again, the whole key of this project is to look at the long-term goals and the long-term trend lines for Maine and to figure out what is the trajectory that will truly get there. One of the ways that the council each year and this year tries to highlight the key conversation points for Mainers and for Maine leaders is by identifying what we call gold stars. 
things that have made especially significant research, recent improvement or especially significant um, standing relative to their uh, stated benchmark, and red flags, which are things that have um, a significant gap or um, negative performance against where we would really like them to go as a state. This year, three gold stars in diverse arenas, pre-kindergarten education, our investments in preschool programs in Maine are paying off and um, are really strong relative to our peers. Uh, safety, um, where measures of crime are off the charts good here in Maine, and I think people appreciate that as one of our calling cards in quality of life. And water quality, one of the several environmental indicators that are very strong here in Maine, and again, part of that Maine brand that we often speak of. Those are the three gold stars. The four <laughs> red flags this year are also diverse in nature. One is labor force. The challenges that we're hearing every day from businesses across Maine in terms of finding the workers they need um, that shows up in the, in the big data. Research and development or R&D expenditures. We continue to lag our national and peer group states on that. And we know that innovation is key, not only to how we weathered this pandemic, but also to leapfrogging into the future. Broadband connectivity. Um, we adopted a new, even more ambitious benchmark this year, the 100, over 100 so-called standard in terms of what is truly robust broadband. And I think the commissioner is going to talk about how we measure up on that measure. More urgent than ever as we increasingly work from home, do commerce from home, um, school from home, and on and on. And then finally, the fourth red flag this year is housing affordability. Um, we had seen this begin to slip in recent years in Maine, and we suspect that the trends we've seen of the desirability of Maine to out-of-staters who are um, juicing that housing market has made that trend accelerate even more in terms of affordability challenges here in Maine. So three gold stars, four red flags, and a number of other points of interest. In addition to the red flags, we're constantly trying to make the report better, more contemporary, uh, more useful to Mainers and Maine leaders. Uh, this year, we added greenhouse gas emissions, CO2, um, as a new indicator to add to the existing environmental indicators so that those who are interested in climate change in Maine and tracking our progress on Maine's climate action plan um, can look to measures of growth themselves to see that progress. I mentioned that we have a new body of data in broadband connectivity, uh, a longstanding ben uh, a topic in measures of growth, but a new approach to defining where we really need to go to. Finally, this year, I wanted to mention um, that the way we present the product is more contemporary than ever, that we finally have a true digital um, platform for the product, not just a static PDF, and a truly mobile optimized version of the product. So, you know, it's, it's valuable to put this out as a guidepost for Mainers, but the more Mainers who can readily access it um, and access it in a form um, that is at their fingertips, the better. And we're just thrilled to announce this year that we've finally been able to make that step. Um, the Go Growth Council is nonpartisan. It's data-driven. Um, and every year we do this to present this to the executive branch and the legislature to try to guide their actions. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to our chair, Steve Von Vogt, who will kick off the series of council members really adding context to um, what we're rolling out this year. Steve, take it away. Thanks, Jill. Uh, well, now more important than ever, Maine needs strong cross-sector leadership and strategic investments based on unbiased and unbiased data and analysis. This is important as we track and highlight opportunities for improvement in the lives of each individual Mainer and in each Maine community. There are four indicators in this realm that the council would like to highlight. The first indicator is new introduced last year, and that's racial and ethnic income equity. Maine's white households and the, the poverty disparities between Maine's white households and those of people of color and Latino and Hispanic Mainers continues to be stark. So we there is there is an important thing that we should pay attention to here. Um, the council strongly believes that Maine needs the contributions of every resident, and this will show up in some of the other indicators, um, and to be a safe and prosperous home for families of all races and ethnicities if it is to achieve a vibrant 
and sustainable economy. Additionally, gender income equity, a longstanding metric that measures the disparity between incomes uh, of males and females fell 4% further in this last year. Now, as we all know, this last year was not a normal year and it's, these are all a snapshot in time. So as I go through each of these, you can think about what the effect of the pandemic has been on them. Similarly, uh, on a positive note, and also probably affected by the uh, pandemic is Maine's safety. Uh, Maine is, uh, 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 the safety metric underscores once again, uh, a big factor in people moving here from all over the country. Maine's crime rate fell yet again in 2020, down another 7% to 12.6% per thousand residents, the second lowest in the nation. And lastly, I'd like to mention labor force. Any of us who run a business or go to a restaurant or use a service in Maine are aware that Maine's labor force has, is a problem. Once again, and this again may be a pandemic factor, in 2020, the labor force shrank by 3%, which translates to 20,000 fewer working Mainers. Um, this is a trend that We'll only over time know if it's just an aberration of the current snapshot in time, but these are all areas of concern and that we should be paying attention to. Um, of course, livability and ability to thrive are also intricately woven with a state's infrastructure and public private willingness and dedication to innovate. To speak to those points, here is Luann Ballesteros, a fellow member of the Growth Council and Vice President of External and Governmental Affairs with the Jackson Laboratory. Luann? You're muted, Luann. Sorry. There you <laughs> like go. My first day on Zoom or something. I know, um, I know. Thanks, thanks, Steve. So I'm gonna address the three um, really important infrastructure indicators, research and development, greenhouse gas emissions and housing affordability. Our ability to innovate as individuals, businesses, organizations and communities has perhaps never been more critical to Maine's success than it is right now. What some would call Yankee or Maine ingenuity um, has really proven to be a key weapon against COVID in the past uh, year and a half, two years. But I think it's really the ability to leverage assets um, to be able to pivot that makes the big difference in, in whether you survive and, and prosper in the down economy. But we have to have those assets in place before we can use them to pivot. I think a key to our collective success on this front, and I know that the um, Growth Council agrees with this, as does the state, um, excuse me, and the Mills administration, will be increased investment in research and development. As Yellow noted, this is an area the council is flagging as, as a concern. As of 2018, which is the most recent year that data is available, Maine's total spending on R&D was $527 million, which represents only 0.8% of our total GDP. That ranks us 43rd of the 50 states. We must do better if we're going to succeed. Um, and with respect to pivoting and, and the ability to use that um, to, to, toward the state's success, um, I just wanna say the Jackson Laboratory has leveraged investment by Maine taxpayers over multiple years um, to put infrastructure in place that was absolutely critical to our pivot during, during COVID, um, both with COVID testing and ongoing um, testing and, and uh, sequencing of the variants that are currently plaguing the country with COVID. Um, infrastructure is also gonna be um, key to attracting and maintaining the work workforce we need to recover and grow Maine's economy. The council wants to highlight our new greenhouse gas emissions metric from 2016 to 2017, again, most recent year for which data is available, emissions in Maine dropped by 5%. This is a key trend, increased emphasis on and investment in renewable energy sources and lower carbon fuels um, will continue to help reduce emissions. 
Of course, people have to be able to afford houses. Um, they have to have a roof over the head in order to be successful and to want to stay in Maine. Housing affordability is another uh, grave infrastructure and workforce concern. Um, the council has assigned a red flag to this indicator um, with our finding that in 2020, home ownership met or exceeded the affordability threshold in only six of Maine's 13 counties and only one county, Franklin County, had a for affordable rental housing. I know at Jack's um, often hiring for us, both within the state and attracting um, folks from outside the state. Housing affordability and I'll throw in childcare are two really key pieces. So we are, we have just recently, uh, um, Commissioner Johnson was there recently to see, we've actually, um, we have a 24 unit um, employee housing um, facility under construction right now. We hope to have ready to go and folks to be in there. Um, and I know the governor is committed to this as is the legislature. Um, thanks for the opportunity to talk about key indicators. And with that, I'll turn it over to Heather Johnson. Thanks, Luann. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. You know, the measures of growth really uh, intersects and supports and tries to align the metrics with a number of our kind of key state plans. Um, we're, we're working as we work to stabilize and rebuild the economy. Um, if you think about the first one is the 10 year economic strategy, which really looks at a forward looking roadmap for um, focusing on our workforce and development and talent um, and also focuses on innovation and increasing prosperity, both through talent development and through innovation. Uh, the other important document is the Governor's Economic Recovery Committee, um, which at the end of November 2020 issued a report that includes recommendations to help kind of offset for the impact of the pandemic um, and then continue to get back to the work of implementing the strategic plan. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about a couple of these key indicators. One of them is broadband connectivity. You know, I think we've gotten past the point where we have to talk about why broadband's important. When I first started, we were still talking about why it mattered. And as you think about discussions like these, you can see Senator Stewart's in his car, I'm in my car, all of the participants are across the state, right? And this allows us to do a lot more things. We can be a lot more efficient and take in a lot of different input um, and that's just one reason, you know, the pandemic exposed this, the critical nature of high-speed internet, um, kids, businesses, commerce, health systems, um, kind of across the board and, and communities need it if, if we're gonna be a place where we can attract people here to stay long-term. Um, and we're certainly seeing an aggressive in-migration into Maine. Um, high-speed connectivity will be a key way for us to be able to keep those folks here. Um, yellow reference that we're using a new measure to be more aggressive about what is functional broadband and how do we get that out to every main resident and every main business. Um, using that data set, it shows that only 18% of main locations have access to high-speed internet. I will say we are one of the only states using that type of metric right now. So that is very aspirational and we are excited to be aspirational in this space because we, we want to be world-class. Going forward, because of new federal funding and the focus that the administration and frankly, communities across the state, residents and businesses have put on broadband, we have an opportunity to close the gap of service in our state. Um, we've made investments in mapping data, which really tell us where and how. Um, and we're fortunate to have internet service providers who are committed to improving the quality of service in the state. So we have great partners, robust community engagement and a good planning process that will create that solid pipeline of projects. Um, the new federal resources will enable both the Connect Main Authority and the Main Connectivity Authority to leverage those assets and see really significant gains on broadband in the next few years. Um, the other category that I'm gonna talk a little bit about is wages. Uh, wages was a key um, goal as part of the strategic plan and was really tied to as we grew productivity across the state, wages would grow in parallel with that productivity growth, right? As we had productivity growth, 
there would be additional returns that then could be shared as wages and everybody could share in that value growth. Um, what I think you'll see in this report is something different than that, right? It's a one-year measure um, that is a pand pandemic measure. And, you know, I think it's a metric that is that we are very cautious about as a council because there are a lot of anomalies in this particular one year set of data um, given impacts to to kind of frontline lower wage jobs in some cases, um, the number of people who have left and changed jobs for a variety of reasons. And certainly um, Steve talked a little bit about supply and demand. So I think that that's something that we're gonna have to keep an eye on um, and look at that metric and, and look at the intent of that metric as we, as we go forward. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over um, to State Senator James Dill to talk a little bit about education and workforce development. Thanks, Heather. And uh, welcome to everybody here this afternoon. Uh, um, one of the many hats that I wear is I'm chair of the local school board. So education is very um, uh, important to, to me and, and what, I, what I do. And one of the things that the uh, council found um, in putting this report together and looking at the data um, is uh, the information about education. There's some good points and there's some areas of concern on the data, especially um, when it comes to its implications for workforce and economic growth. So let me start out first with one of the good points and that is pre kindergarten education. In 2019 and 20, 50 percent of Maine's four-year-olds were registered in pre-K. This is well above both the U.S. and the New England averages, and continued improvement on uh, this measure will likely have a positive impact on students' academic proficiency and future success, and you'll see why this is important and when I talk about the next couple of issues, and that is the flip side of this and which is in 2019, which is the most recent year we have uh, data available, only 30%, 36% of Maine fourth graders were proficient in reading. Even more disturbing is that this metric has not improved over the last decade. This indicator is a strong predictor of future educational attainment, employment, and earnings. We've got to do a better job with our kids and uh, you know, getting more kids into pre-K, getting them more engaged in school early is going to be critical. And it's one of these things that we have to uh, um, continue with. Unfortunately, along with those same lines in 2019, only 34% of Maine eighth graders were proficient in math. And this is particularly disappointing given that this met metric had been improving only to slip again. And this is before COVID forced kids into remote learning and all the disruptions and challenges that come with it. And that's where I want to say that, you know, is personally for me is, is a huge concern. As you see some of these metrics for the um, fourth graders and eighth graders um, with what happened with COVID and remote learning over the last uh, year, um, year plus, and of course, we've already talked about broadband and how important mm -hmm. that is, but it was also extremely important to some of the students trying to um, learn remotely. Some had broadband, some didn't. So I'm particularly concerned as we move forward over the next uh, two to four years of these younger kids, the fourth graders, et cetera, moving on up, how and the younger kids in that, how they're going to be doing in their um, fourth grade testing and eighth grade testing. So we got to got to keep at this. I want to round out my uh, remarks again on a, a more positive note. Um, we carefully revamped the, the post post secondary um, education metrics to include not only degrees but also valuable credentials and certifications that uh, that are available to the students that are out there. Um, this brings to 52 the percentage of working age Maine is holding associates, bachelors, graduates or professional degrees are credentials like certification licenses, digital badges, and military service. So I think this is one of our important metrics and we gotta keep going. And again, I'm also involved with the CTE school here locally in Bangor, and they offer many badges and certifications and that type of thing. And I think this is gonna be crucial to our workforce as we move forward. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to my uh, 
State Senate and Growth Council colleague, Senator Trey Stewart of Aristic, for some final thoughts and key highlights. Trey. Thanks, Jim. Uh, appreciate it. And thanks, uh, everyone, for being here today and for members of the press for here today to, to hear about this new report. Um, as you'll see, I'm in uh, Millinocket today. I pulled over at the rest stop here down to the southern tip of my district. Um, so I think for, for me as a legislator, and particularly as, as I, I wear a number of different hats, um, one of which, you know, obviously I'm on the growth council, obviously I'm a legislator, but I'm also a young person in Maine. And I think that that is really, that's been my interest in, the, in joining the growth council uh, a few years ago when I first got on um, and why I think it's so important because for me, um, you know, sometimes long term in the, in the legislature can be a year and a half or two years. And as everybody knows, that's not really long term, right? Um, but I think that Maine is in such um, a at such a crucial point in our state's history that we really have to be thinking um, in terms of decades um, and not necessarily, you know, budget cycles and, and you know, legislative sessions. Um, and it's tough to do. It's a really tough, uh, uh, you know, juggling, uh, uh, you know, uh, process that we have to engage in as legislators in order to make sure that, you know, those short term things are still being taken care of. Uh, and I think now more than ever, um, you know, the last uh, couple of years with COVID, there are so many things that, um, you know, seem like emergencies and seem like, you know, things that are in dire straits. And, and they are right. I mean, there are things that are urgent and need to be looked at right away. But at the same time, we can't take our eye off of the ball long term. And I think that that's really the point that um, this report and this group of folks work uh, every every year to continue that effort. In, you know, um, even though all of these other uh, you know competing challenges we're, we're we're faced with as well in the short term, um, and they certainly engage in that, right? I mean, everybody on this call has engaged in 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 helping to you know navigate through the pandemic in some way, shape, or form uh, through the work that they do, um, and we're lucky to have them. But we also have to be, be ever vigilant of you know the future and uh, how Maine uh, compares with other states and how we're going to um, you know craft a a, a, a course here um, for the next generation and the generation after that. Um, and so I, I really think that um, there were a lot of really uh, important points that were outlined today. I think uh, you know we've underscored that we know that Maine is a great place to live, work, and raise a family. That's still true, right? But I think there's also data points that uh, we certainly feel it as engaged community members. Um, you know, things like broadband, uh, things like educational attainment. Um, these are these are things that are, are are sort of constant, and what we have to constantly work towards. Um, but you know, the, the what we're seeing when we walk down main streets in small towns. It's always nice to be able to quantify what we're feeling into data points. And I think that that's uh, the benefit of, of what this group uh, and what this report in particular does. I think if you look at you know, the labor force, it's a great way to sort of distill down uh, what we're feeling as folks within our communities across the state and every corner of the state. Uh, but to, re be real, uh, to be able to look at it from a uh, statistical uh, uh, framework, Right, and, and long-term trends and, and be able to see how that all fits together so that folks like Jim and I and, and the commissioner uh, can, can come up with some solutions. And uh, maybe they'll be um, you know, state government related, maybe they won't be. Hopefully there'll be uh, some collaboration with the private sector and I look forward to that uh, and continuing to work with you folks going forward. Uh, and so again, thanks for being here today uh, and I'll kick it back to, I think, Yellow to uh, close us out. Thank you, Senator. And Thanks to um, all five members of the council for helping to present and, and really provide context and meaning to this year's product. I wanna um, extend a few thank yous. Um, I wanna thank Kathy Shannon and Rosie Vanetta Stein on the MDF staff who really helped spearhead the council's work this year and Kathy spearheading the final design and, and digital production. Um, Kate Deludio, the former state economist is the data guru behind the measures of growth this year. And we could not do this without her, needless to say. Uh, and then I'm thrilled to say that we use a team of main based vendors and I wanna thank Pika and Belfast for design. I wanna thank Vaunt in Westbrook for digital services. And I wanna thank JS McCarthy and Augusta for printing. So we're thrilled to have a great internal and external team uh, here in Maine. Um, just to recap, um, 27th edition of uh, the measures of growth, um, 30 indicators this year, uh, several changes, several upgrades, and we've highlighted 
three red, uh, three gold stars, and four red flags that we've been um, discussing today. Um, and I want to thank everyone and open it up um, to see if any of our friends in the press do have any questions uh, before we wrap up today. Seeing none, we appreciate you being with us and you can um, access the report at mdf.org uh, or reach out to us if you wish to um, schedule an interview or a presentation by our staff or by any member of the council about the 2021 measures of growth. Thank you for being with us.